Hi, a very warm welcome to the second webinar presented by the IOSH Theatre Advisory Group Committee. I'm Hayley Seddon, I am co-vice chair of the committee um, and my day job is head of OSH for the Royal Shakespeare Company. The Theatre Advisory Group was set up in 2016 and our aims are to provide a global forum and support in relation to health, safety and sustainability, to provide you with opportunities for CPD and networking, to produce industry guidance and advice, and to provide opportunities for nurturing the development of any individuals looking to enter into a career in the theatre industry. And joining me today on this panel, I have four other members of the committee. So firstly, um, we have Tom Good. And Tom is a production manager and safety advisor with Good Project, Projects Limited. Tom has lived through about 30 years of production experience um, since he originally trained in stage management at Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. And Tom currently shares his time between production management and consultancy. And he's also a chartered safety and health practitioner. Tom will be talking us through the principles of risk assessment in this session and exploring how we can put them into place via tangible actions. Then we have um, Greg Petruska, um, who joins us live from New York City, nice and early in the morning for Greg now. Um, Greg is the Director for Environmental Health and Safety at NBC Universal. And we also have Adam Tackett, who is the Manager of Production Safety for Live Theatre and Features at NBC Universal. Um, Adam is usually based in New York City, but today he is live from London. And um, Greg and Adam will be discussing how the principles of risk assessment can be applied to psychosocial hazards at work that pose risks to our mental health and well-being. And then last but definitely not least, uh, we have Phil Brown. Uh, Phil is the other co-vice chair of the committee, and Phil is also head of risk and safety for Society of London Theatres and UK Theatre. His role supports members in all aspects of risk management, and he also directly promotes and influences industry health and safety changes and how their successful application can reduce accidents and costs. He is a chartered fellow of IOSH and a fellow of double IRSM as well. And Phil is going to be talking to us today about uh, risks and hazards to consider as we um, reoccupy and reopen our venues. Um, at the end of the presentations, uh, we will open up the discussion to you guys as well. So you're very welcome um, to ask a question in the Q&A &A chat box throughout the presentations. Um, uh, but at the end of the presentations, you can also use the raise hand function as well. Um, and then um, Dimple, our IOSH colleague, uh, will be able to enable your microphone then so that you can speak. Um, so um, let's get back to basics then. And I'm going to hand over to you, Tom, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hayley, um, and welcome everybody. So I'm going to go back to basics and set the scene really for the other conversations, really just to cover off um, the, the basic first principles of risk assessment. Uh, so this is all going to be based on the HSE's INDG 163, which, um, which is the kind of short guide, brief guide to controlling risks in the workplace. Uh, so before we even start on the risk assessment process, to me, the most important thing to do right up front is to decide what the scope of the assessment, what it is we're actually looking at. It's very important to get that set up in advance. Um, and so to my mind, when I'm looking at production, I'm deciding whether I'm looking at a particular design element or the use of something. I'll tend to break my risk assessments down maybe into activity, uh, equipment and environment type considerations. Uh, and I might also at that point, when establishing, establishing the scope, be looking at what external help or what additional help and expertise I might be needing when I go through my assessment, because uh, I won't know it all, there's no doubt about that. Um, so then this first step of the risk assessment process itself, everybody is going to be very familiar with all of this, but we're looking at identifying our hazards uh, associated with whatever it is we're, we're including in our scope. So we might be looking at manufacturer's information for a production uh, that might just be equipment that we buy off the shelf. It might be a set that we're designing specifically. So we're gonna to need to talk to the fabricator and the designers uh, about the sort of hazards that might be associated with, with that equipment when it comes onto the site. Um, obviously, as per most workplaces, we might be able to have a good look around and, and just 
do a site survey or an observation around the workplace, but for production that's still on the drawing board, we won't have the benefit of that in terms of our hazard identification. Uh, so we might need to use some other techniques as well. Uh, there's obviously HSE guidance, which we can use. There's a huge amount of industry guidance that our industry has prepared through the different um, representative bodies uh, that we can use to help us identify the types of hazard. Um, and we can be looking at incident data, whether it be um, similar things that we've done uh, in the past that have created incidents, or if it's a venue, obviously there might be some trends that, that are developing in terms of uh, that sort of data. Uh, and then to me, the most important element of all of that is the experience of the people undertaking the risk assessment. It's critical that they understand what it is that's uh, being proposed and uh, what the hazards are that are associated with that in the real world rather than some academic process. So experience is a really important part of the process. Uh, as an industry, theatre has a pretty representative um, range of different types of hazards, everything from the mechanical, whether that be moving scenery that might hit people or trucks unloading kit before the, the fit up, electrical hazards associated with the kit that we have on stage in the auditoriums, thermal hazards, whether that be um, something like a pyrotechnic uh, creating heat or uh, it could even be a special effect cryogenic in nature that, that we have to think about extreme cold temperatures as well. Uh, psychological issues, uh, which I think Greg and Adam are going to come on to, so I won't dwell on that. Ergonomic, which could be everything from whether the DSM can see the stage properly from the box they've been put in through a little porthole, or it could be the, um, the very sophisticated management of uh, the performance artists, very high-end uh, athletic ability that goes, goes through those sorts of um, actions as well. Noise and vibration, the obvious examples there would be our uh, high sound pressure levels due to either amplified or acoustic music. Uh, radiation, we might pick out a couple of examples of lasers, but also now with LED technology progressing so much, um, some of the optical um, radiation issues around the light output from screens and, and light fixtures. Uh, and then toxic and biological, which again, we could go back to special effects for toxic or maybe um, substances that are used in prop shops um, but the biological stuff is also important and uh, obviously the most contemporary of those at the moment is our desire to be controlling the, the spread of COVID, the infection rates of COVID in our auditoriums and within our companies. Uh, so that's the identifying the hazards element. Um, the next step is to decide who might be harmed by those and how and it's really clear that the different groups are, are properly identified because different groups of people will be exposed uh, that are exposed to hazard may be at fundamentally different levels of risk um, from that particular hazard. Uh, and it's very important to cooperate and coordinate across different employers where we're working in shared workplaces with this regard as well. Um, many theatrical productions are effectively happening in a shared workplace. Um, so the different groups that we're particularly concerned about, um, we, we're relying heavily on expertise in a lot of our disciplines. So people without that expertise will be at a greater risk than people with the expertise. So for example, members of public going on stage uh, is going to open up a whole degree of risk which didn't exist until you know, while we, we had just the professional company or uh, um, trained, trained practitioners doing the work. Um, there's also groups that we need to look at who have different levels of vulnerability, whether it be young people, uh, children in the cast or whatever else. So there's, there's those groups that we need to consider as well. Very broad spectrum there. Uh, once we've established our hazards and our groups that are at risk from them, then we get on to the exciting bit of actually doing the uh, evaluation of the risk. Uh, and there's a myriad of different ways that we might go about this process. So to me, uh, we need to consider what we're doing already. Uh, we then need to look at, with those controls in place, how likely is it and how severe is it um, if the particular hazard manifests itself? And that should give us some idea about the degree of risk that we're looking at in that point. So. How do we do that? We might use a matrix system where we're pegging likelihood scores against severity scores and it might give us a risk rating that has a number or something, or we might just be referencing against a standard that says, a published standard that says, if you're going to do this, this is how you should do it. Um, and if that's a good practice piece of guidance, that should be enough for us to determine that actually, yes, the risk should be at an acceptably low level. Um, when we're doing that uh, assessment, that evaluation, we need to be paying attention to how um, effective the control measures we're using are, and there is a hierarchy in place for that, which everyone will be familiar with. 
primarily we're looking at eliminating hazards where we can, where we can't, we want to substitute something that is hazardous with something that is less hazardous. Uh, it might be a, a different type of smoke machine that doesn't use a cryogenic product, for example. Um, engineering solutions would, would be the next thing in the line. We might put safe edges on, um, on moving scenery, those sorts of things. Uh, and then we get into administrative control measures, which is where our management systems come into play. As I said before, we're quite heavily reliant on management systems, but they can be hugely effective. When we put together a production, um, there will be a long, prolonged period looking at um, how the design will develop, rehearsal period, so everybody's learning how they're going to do things, what they're going to do. Um, and that management system then carries on on site as well with extended technical rehearsals and dress rehearsals before the production actually starts. So in terms of our management system, there's a huge range of resources that we can use, not just the cast being rehearsed, but also the stage management support and many other as uh, aspects of that as well. So um, we're not, it wouldn't undermine the effectiveness of any um, engineered controls, but with the right input, the right competencies, uh, the right capabilities within the company, then management systems can be made uh, to be very, very effective indeed. And then the last thing on the list is obviously the PPE. Um, so once we've got our assessment done, we should have decided that we've got certain risks or certain hazards which we're doing enough to control and we've got others where we need to do some more and we then want to identify what it is we need to do, who needs to do it and by when. If the hazard has proved to be quite complex or, or, or there's more to it than we thought, then we might go back to the first stage and actually go into more detail in terms of doing a task analysis or a root cause analysis or one of those other techniques that gets into a bit more detail. Once we've got that sorted out, then we're recording significant findings. They need to be simple and focused on the controls. So to my mind, from a production management point of view, I'm trying to include my significant findings in the method statements. Uh, I, most of my design risk assessment work is notes on the drawings that are developed for the production. Uh, and I've got plenty of examples of single page risk assessments that are just a picture with some annotation on it that shows what the hazard is, who, who would be affected by it, and uh, what the controls are. It can be as simple as that. Um, so that's the record. Um, the last step, or the, 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 the next step, um, which can become the first step of a cyclical thing, is to review it, and the review will normally take place um, either if there's a change. Every time we change something, we should consider whether we need to revisit the risk assessment. Maybe we've had an incident and we should learn from that. So we might have another look at our risk assessment at that point. Uh, and in any case, a periodic review. So everyone will be familiar with that. Uh, in terms of the change elements, it might be that people, there's some change in the people involved, some change in the equipment involved, some change in the environment, or uh, somebody's got some additional knowledge that we didn't have before that would all lead to, to change, uh, to review. Um, talked about the rehearsal process there are already many changes during the rehearsal process it's how the development of the management systems work uh, and so that change management element is really really important and it needs to be that cycle that goes back then into the uh, hazard identification uh, to make sure that our risk assessment is at the end of the day suitable and sufficient so I think that's it from me Hayley that was the top line setting the scene before we move on uh, so I'm now going to introduce uh, Greg and Adam, uh, who are going to take us on to how that hopefully is applied to some more specifics. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I was about to say good morning. Um, good morning, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, Adam and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, mental health and psychological issues that can come into practice for risk assessing. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that I look at it, when we think about all of these things are that some of our psychological issues can manifest themselves into physical safety issues and concerns. And it's no longer are we in an environment where the only things we have to concern ourselves with are the physical. Um, we have to look at the whole person approach to safety because some of the ways that stress manifests itself can actually cause physical injury and harm. Um, so when you're looking at doing a risk assessment for stress, which we should be looking at when we're looking at risk assessments for mental health related issues, the one thing to remember is that sometimes we won't recognize it until it happens. Um, and uh, in the UK, there was a 
recent terrorist incident that kind of points this out prophetically that you don't know sometimes that it is going to happen until it does. So the biggest thing that I can stress here is understand and know what some of those symptoms and signs look like. Um, there are times that you can get in a little bit early if you do, um, but also knowing what your steps are and how to risk assess and what you can do to mitigate in the moment is going to potentially be the most helpful in a situation that manifests itself suddenly. Um, Adam, do you wanna? Yeah, Greg, you know, that, that makes me think of a session that you and I did for the US version of, of this group, uh, where we were talking about how do you prepare for the unexpected, you know, because like Greg's saying, we don't, these aren't like black and white things. These aren't visible things all the time. Um, of course, we can assess uh, things that might be triggering for people like obvious things, like maybe there's use of weapons that could be triggering. We can obviously, you know, flag that, you know, what are we going to do to manage that? But we, we don't know what's going to trigger everyone. And sometimes we don't even know it's going to trigger ourselves. So it's more about having that plan in place. Um, and, you know, so, so what are ways to have a plan in place? I think mental health first aider training is really great. You know, we're not making ourselves mental health professionals, but we're there to help recognize and sign point, you know, folks to, to the right person to help them. Um, and I think also just the environment you're in, you know, sometimes in theater, it's been done this way forever. And there's a seniority ranking. Uh, you feel like when you're a new person, you want to always be the yes man. So you can climb that ladder and you, you don't want to ever raise anything uh, bad. So I think it's kind of breaking that stigma to be able to raise your hand and say, hey, uh, I need a moment. Uh, and, and also from a manager's perspective to, to encourage everyone to, to speak up. Um, because when you don't know something and then it, it you know, blindsides you, there's, there's lots to your, your person that could be damaging, but also to the production. You know, you could, it could result in a physical injury if I'm preoccupied or, uh, you know, not really focused because something is really triggering me. It could ma very much manifest into a physical injury. It could, you know, which goes into lost time, could lose performance, could, you know, so it, it, it ripples and, and is felt throughout every level of production. Um, because sometimes you have to make that case to management to, to, to highlight the need and to, for cost to, 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 to do this, you know? Um, I know that Greg and I promote using, you know, your toolbox talk, your, your safety meeting at the beginning of calls and stuff to, to put in a little bit about mental health, you know, just saying it's okay to not be okay. And that's, that's simply it. It's okay to not be okay. Um, please raise your hand. Please pull someone aside if you don't feel okay so we can uh, see what we need to do to move on and avoid it rippling into maybe a physical injury, loss of production. I think some of the more important things to think about here is that no two people will manifest signs or symptoms the same way. And the way that I process something might be instantaneous and my reaction might be instantaneous, but the way that Adam processes something might not be so instantaneous. He might compartmentalize it for a few days and it will be days after the event where it finally manifests itself for Adam. And there is no set in stone way that any of your psychological stress will manifest itself or predictable patterns. Um, and that makes parts of this process for risk assessment difficult and challenging. Um, the biggest things that you can do are, again, have your arsenal of uh, everything at your fingertips for when something does manifest itself and be ready to go when you need those tools. Um, I think recognizing some of the signs and symptoms of how stress can manifest itself are really important. Adam alluded to mental health first aid training, and that is just like having a regular first aider in the mix is always a valid uh, representation. Um, but again, even in some of those signs, like people wanting to take more time off or being constantly late or withdrawn or mood swings, uh, they don't always manifest themselves in the same ways for everybody either. Um, but knowing all of those things can be really, really helpful. 
knowing the folks that you're working with can be really helpful too. If I know that Adam's pattern, sorry, I'm picking on you, Adam, because you're the one okay. right here with me. Um, <laughs> if I know that Adam's pattern is to not be very talkative and all of a sudden he is very, very talkative for days in a row, there might be something that I need to kind of pull back and explore a little bit more. Why is this happening? Has there been some something that happened outside of work that is impacting work now? Is there too much going on? Have I asked Adam to do too much at the office? All of these things can help. And having those conversations is really beneficial to helping to keep everything on track. Um, I think with mental health and psychological risk assessing, uh, the most difficult challenge is, is that you are probably doing it in the moment. There are a lot of things that you can do ahead of time, again, by identifying areas and places and tools that you have. But a lot of what you'll be doing in the moment is seriously in the moment of, okay, I know where all of my tools are. I know what the signs are. What are we going to do next? Um, and I think that the one thing that I would like to point out for this piece of the puzzle is that this is, like any risk assessment, it is a living, breathing document, but even more so when you're looking at mental health and psychological stress, it is a living, breathing document that you might be updating on the fly as you're going through it. Absolutely. And I think one of the, you know, uh, controls to always, you know, lower that score if we were thinking of it in a matrix, you know, for, you know, risk versus likelihood of severity um, is, you know, not to think of it so uh, uh, reactively, like we are, we are looking for symptoms and then we're going to, you know, uh, then go from there, but proactively to create a psychologically safe space to come to work to. Um, and that's a lot from the tone. Um, and I, that kind of points me back to a toolbox talk to just always kind of make it known that it is okay to not be okay. Um, and then it's never one big deal, you know, this like taboo thing to talk about. It's just part of our culture. Um, yeah. And that's a great full disclosure. Greg is my manager. Um, I think he's speaking hypothetically. I'm not sure. What he's, uh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, but, but we, we definitely operate. Uh, that way, and and it is a safe place, and that's what we try to spread through our productions. Uh, and slowly but surely, we see it uh, taking root, and the benefits of it. Um, anything else? Adam? I I mean, you know me. I could ramble forever. I, I am very talkative. So when he was like, "Adam's not very talkative," I was like, "Oh no, I know we're being hypothetical here." Um, um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. For now. I think for now we will turn over to, I think we're at our time frame. So we're going to turn over to Phil to take us through the next section. Thanks guys. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Um, I guess what I'm going to kind of cover is kind of try to summarize some of the bits that the other have mentioned. Um, and I think Tom mentioned it quite early on that as an industry, we had a, a really good record from, from a health and safety perspective pre-COVID. The health and safety executive actually held us up as a, as a role model for some other aspects of the entertainment industry, as someone who um, others should look at and turn to in regards to our good health and safety practice. And I guess what my concern is, and probably shared with a lot of people who are on the committee, is since COVID, we've obviously had a huge transition of staff. Um, obviously, some unfortunately have been made redundant. Some have left the industry to work elsewhere. And what we need to ensure is that we kind of do get back to basics and also make sure that the good health and safety standards that we had pre-COVID are still in place and are put back into place now that we're starting to reopen and re-emerge from the COVID crisis. One thing I wanted to touch on, and this will be more familiar with some of our colleagues in the UK than some of our international colleagues here on the call today, um, there's lots of tools out there that can help you identify what you need to do to run a venue successfully. Obviously, there's a health and safety executive who've got websites which will mention some of the, the key hazards that um, Tom alluded to right at the start of this session. And obviously, the sections within that on the health and safety executive website, which will tell you the kind of hazards to look out for. But one thing that's more pertinent to the theatre world is a document which we call um, fondly the Yellow Book. And, and the actual title of the Yellow Book is the Technical Standards for Places of Entertainment. Now, if you're not familiar with this document, um, it's published by the ABTT, 
And it, the committee who look after that book um, is made up of health and safety professionals, um, health and safety um, professionals from industry, as well as professionals who work for local authorities and the central health and safety executive in the UK. And that document has got quasi legal status in the UK. And for us in the UK, that's really the Bible for us to look at how we can successively manage health and safety issues within our venues. Now, I just wanted to focus on a couple of sections and, and I'll put these links in, in the chat so you've got uh, access to this. Um, one section which is really good, which kind of encapsulates some of the things we've already been talking about already today is section N1, which is called management. And section N1 looks at how we manage risks, but also looks at who we can allocate some of those responsibilities to in order to manage those risks. So it talks about the risk assessment process that Tom talked about. It talks about how we can look at likelihood and consequence. And it, it tries to get across who should be taking some responsibilities to, for those things within a theatre setting. Within the document, there's also some really useful tables and some useful checklists. And there is a, a table that's called table 28, which obviously won't mean a lot to all of you, um, but table 28 talks about what a venue operator needs to think about um, in regards to testing to ensure that hazards are, are spotted proactively and also looking at inspection regimes about how frequently things need to be checked within a venue. And it looks at weekly, it looks at annual uh, tests and, and it gives a venue operator that guidance in order to make sure that those hazards that may cause problems are identified quickly and you can put plan preventative maintenance systems in place to make sure those things aren't going to cause you any accidents going forward. And there's also a, a really useful checklist, which is table 30, again, won't mean a lot to all of you, um, but table 30 actually has a checklist that you can use as a duty manager or a venue manager, which goes through, again, some of the basic hazards that you might need to identify and make sure that those things are picked up before you start to show, in order to make sure again that the venue operator can be proactive in its approach to managing risk. So it's a great tool. Um, you have to pay for it, unfortunately. Um, but once you've bought it once, you get regular online updates. Um, and if people aren't familiar with it, um, again, the UK should be, but if, if international colleagues aren't familiar with it, it might also give you some insight into how you can proactively manage health and safety issues within your, your organization. Obviously, it's very weighted towards UK legislation, but it will still give you some insights into how you can manage those hazards that you might face on a day-to-day -day basis. I also wanted to talk about a few things that have come on my radar over the last few weeks, and, and thankfully, none of them are COVID related. But they are causing me and some other colleagues some concern about what we might need to do as an industry to make sure that these problems aren't going to keep recurring, but more importantly, aren't going to become a, a kind of a standard problem that is going to cause issues within the industry. Now, um, Greg mentioned we, we had a, a tourist incident very recently in the UK. We've actually had two um, unfortunate incidents in the last few weeks. So what has happened is the UK government have decided to increase our threat level in the UK. Now we've moved to what's called severe, which means that a, a terrorist incident is very likely in the UK. Now that threat hasn't been directly attributed to theatre. So theatre hasn't been earmarked as a, as a venue or a, a, an industry that is at particular risk, but it does mean that we have to look at security in its more holistic approach to make sure that we have upped our security presence and our awareness about what could be happening in and around our venues. And one of the, the, I suppose, the outcomes of having to do additional COVID checks means that some of our audience members are perhaps not being admitted into our venues as quickly as they were, they were pre-COVID, which does mean that we might have more congregation of audience members outside of our theatres, which the terrorists could be seen as an attractive target. So even though the threat level directly hasn't affected us in theatre, it does mean that, again, proactively as venue operators and safety practitioners, we should be looking at our current security measures and seeing if there's anything that we can do additional 
just to make sure that our customers and our staff feel safe in, in this current climate that we face. To a lesser extent, we're also starting to see an increase in violence and aggression towards our members of staff, in particular within auditoriums. Now, we're still trying to get to the bottom of what may be the catalyst for this. We, we, we have had unsocial behaviour in previous times, obviously pre-COVID again, this wasn't um, something that, that didn't happen, but it does seem to mean that, that we, we are seeing an increase since we have reopened our venues. Now, it could be that people are, are having a little bit more too much alcohol, perhaps they're, they're being over exuberant in their behaviour because they've been locked up for so long with the, with the lockdown that we had, we, we're not quite sure. So again, from a proactive perspective, that might be something you need to look at. And, in, and quite interestingly, this month's IOSH magazine is actually featuring quite heavily about violence and aggression towards members of staff at work. And, and it's not just unique to theatre. We are seeing an increase in retail, in transport, um, but obviously for us it, as the theatre advisory group, it is something that we're going to try to look at and, and see if there is any common themes, but more importantly, is there anything that we can perhaps suggest to you and the wider industry about how we can resolve some of these situations. Um, Greg and Adam mentioned uh, the, the stress and mental health related issues. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, because of the staff shortages and the staff changes and some of the issues that have affected us through lockdown, we are seeing some increases in this, in particular with our back of house teams and some of our front of house teams. So again, something that has just recently been launched, which again, isn't theatre specific, but might be useful to you. Um, the Health and Safety Executive have just launched a brand new campaign, which is called Work in Minds. And it's brought together lots of experts in the field of mental health, well-being, and stress management to look at how venue operators and employers need to manage the, the levels of stress within their workplaces, but it also gives employees some tips as well. So as I said, I, I'll, I'll put that link in there because it, it, it's very new. I, I've had a look through it and it, it, there's some really basic tools, but some really good tools for smaller operators who perhaps haven't got access to occupational health specialists. And it will give you some tools to actually put into practice some practical ma management solutions to, to try to manage that risk of stress within your workplaces. And the final thing I wanted to touch on, and I think um, when we look at managing risks, we, it's, it's often seen as a negative thing, but I think there's also some things to look at in regards to opportunities. And one thing that has been really good um, over the last few months, it, there's been a, a huge amount of work looking at sustainability within the theatre world. I know some of you might not be as heavily involved in sustainability as others, but um, there, is, there is some partner organisations, the Theatres Trust, the ABTT, and, and my own organisation. We've been working with the industry to develop what's called the Theatre Green Book. Now, sustainability is, is high on a lot of people's agenda. Obviously, COP just happened very recently in, in Glasgow. So what we've developed is a, a series of um, tools and a series of proactive ways of looking at how you can make your theatre more green and sustainable. And the Green Book is split into three sections. So the first one is looking at your theatre productions, how you can look at making your productions greener. So can you reuse sets? Can you reuse props? Are you buying your, your wood from sustainable resources? All of those kind of aspects are looked at in that production section. The middle section is about how you run your building in a sustainable way. So it's looking at, um, could be you know, looking at your heat sources, your lighting sources, all the aspects of running a building, um, you know, making sure that the fabric of the building is secure so the, the roof's not leaking, you've got proper insulation in your, in your loft or in what, whatever it may be, all aspects of that have been looked at in, in that section. And then the final section, which will be launched later in the year, is looking at venue operations and the whole gambit of what we do in theatre. So front of house, back of house, marketing, all aspects of what we do in theatre. The final section will be looking at how we can manage those ways of those departments and those ways of working in a more sustainable and environmentally friendly way. So just before I kind of go off, I think there is some common things that we need to look at, but there's also some kind of more um, unique things that we are seeing that we as a theatre advisory group are going to focus on going forward. 
and there may well be kind of some subjects of future webinars but i'm going to stop talking because you've probably heard a lot of us for quite a while now and i'm going to pass back to our chair Hayley. thanks so much bill um, Phil, whilst you were talking, um, uh, there was a question that came up in the chat box, but I'm not sure if everybody can see it. Um, okay. So it's from, from Mumtaz, and um, they're asking, um, they're saying that they went to a, a, a theatre venue recently and noticed, you know, crowds forming and that. And, and just thinking back to the COVID checks that we're now having to do for audience members, you know, prior to their entering the venues, is, is there any way that we can look at doing any of these COVID checks? Um, before arrival at the venue that might help um, in terms of also managing the, the the security hazards as well so it's a really good thought thank yeah, you yeah I, I think i think there is some aspects that obviously in the uk um we, we, we get slightly complicated because we have devolved nations um so three of the nations in the uk are requiring covid pass to be um, demonstrated on arrival at theatres but in England which the vast majority of theatres will be um, that isn't a, a legal requirement at this stage that might change in the future and obviously we'll cross that bridge if it comes to it um, but I do think that some venues that have operated um, the COVID pass do try to get as much information as they can pre-arrival to try to ease that that movement of audiences through the, the, the foyer as quickly as possible I think invariably it has added extra costs onto some of the venues because you will need more staff to do the checks but what i have seen and i have uh, heard about is when there's a queue of people they'll have another member of staff who will go along the queue check in the id rather than wait until they get to the door so when they get to the door they've got a sticker on their their, their ticket or a sticker on their form which says they their, their covid check has already been seen but but i don't know if adam and greg obviously over in, in broadway obviously that's a mandatory requirement so you might have a, a better insight into how to do things over there yeah it is um uh, we, we have uh government recognized passes that we can show usually just our id and it shows up the date of our last uh vaccination because we have to show vaccination as opposed to negative test um in new york at least uh or, or or a negative test but i think for us it's more common to show vaccination um, another thing that I've seen even here in London this past week, um, I know I went to the theater last night and I had a specific time to queue and I wasn't able to get into that queue until my my allotted time. I arrived like five minutes early and they asked me to go hang out somewhere else until that time started. So it was never a rush of folks. Um, so that might be an effective way to, to, to you know, stop a big crowd. Thank you. And um, I can see now Phil is adding in those links into the chat box as well. So yeah, go and cut and paste from, from there. Um, so thanks ever so much to our speakers. So it's it's over, it's over to um to you guys now um as well. So if you have a question um that you would like to ask, then please use the QA box. Um, and you can also use the raise hand function as well. So if you want to um have your microphone turned on and and, um, and, and speak out loud and um, then please um, click the raise hand button and we'll and we'll sort that out for you. Um, uh, Haley, we do have yeah. one question that's just popped up. Uh, with a new and or transient workforce, how would you encourage trust for people to talk to a mental health first aider? In addition, given production pressures, how will time be given for this to happen? That's a great question. It is a really great question. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying, I was thinking I had that written down myself, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's it, absolutely like we, you know, we're fast paced, aren't we? In our production world, you know, you come in, you rehearse, you haven't got time to, to breathe, let alone kind of get to know each other. So so where we rely really strongly on trust and building, you know, building relationships and getting to know each other so that we can spot when we're feeling unwell or not feeling ourselves. Yeah. How do we do that in that time pressure? Absolutely. I think one of the things that I would just highlight that I think Adam mentioned in our session section was make the time and it, until parts of culture start to change around being able to talk about these things openly, that the time pressure is always going to be a challenge. Um, but it takes that first person to stand up and step up and say, I need to make the time to talk about this. Um, and if we incorporate things into toolbox talks or safety meetings, that there is time and availability, um, that is a start. Um, also, 
with regard to someone speaking to a mental health first aider, I don't know that we will ever know that someone has or hasn't availed themselves of that resource. I don't know that we want to as employers know that either, um, but just like having a first aider available, having a mental health first aider available is equally as important. And whether we know or not that those resources are being taken advantage of, it's a resource that people have and just knowing who they can go and talk to as a safe space is the important piece. If I could just add on to the time bit, I think if you incorporate that in to every uh, you know safety talk, it actually takes up less time. You know, mm -hmm. hey everyone, we're doing this today. There's the e-stop. There's the fire extinguishers. Reminder: if you feel overwhelmed or stressed or whatever, have a timeout. Come talk to me. Whatever, and it's as simple as that, really. Mm -hmm. um, and and as far as trusting the mental health first aider, I think it's important to know that that person's just there to help you get to the person who is going to help you. They're not the mental health professional. Um, so it's more of a bridge to friend to grab your hand and say, hey, I'm gonna take you to get some help. Um, and I think maybe that uh, is a helpful way to think about it. So it's not so much like I have to confide, you know, things I don't wanna tell everyone to this person. You don't have to, you can just ask them for a bit of help as to where to find that resource. And I think part, and part of the mental health first aid of training as well, that those individuals go through are around recognising signs and symptoms and recognising when somebody might be struggling and that. So, so you can use them, you know, use those mental health first aiders as well as, as a proactive tool to kind of, yeah, to, to spot them. People maybe are not coping, coping so, so well. Maybe I've also just put a link in that we launched uh, at my employee Salt UK Theatre, we launched um, some new principles for safe and inclusive working which some people might find interesting, which kind of talked about how we can be more open and transparent and supportive towards our workforce, which looks at mental health, but also looks at bullying and harassment and other safeguarding issues. So some people might find that useful. Thank you. Um, I just don't, um, just, yeah, just, we haven't got any questions at the moment, have any additional ones yet. So, so do shout up if you want to join in the discussion. Um, yeah, I was, and I was just, um, I was thinking back to Tom's presentation that we're talking about um, hazard spotting, you know, identifying hazards, that first step, and, and it's really important, isn't it, to, to know that, or to, to recognise or accept that we don't always know everything, so how do we find, how do we find those things that we don't really, yeah, what, how do we know what we don't know, <laughs> where do we go, and that's so, so it's about having that um, kind of, almost like a black book of, of external places to go like so like we said the HSE guidance and the yellow book that um that Phil was talking about that the ABTT have published um and other external agencies and that yeah so it's it's really important that we we don't just focus on the things that we do know about that but we know where to go and know where to call on other experts to to show us what we what we might have missed um and certainly then I think I thought that kind of segued in really well then to uh, what Greg and Adam were saying about, you know, about the psychosocial risks and the, the you know, the, the, the hazard of stress that, that that's an unknown sometimes, isn't it? And yeah, so, so how do we kind of, um, yeah, how, how, what tools do we need to, to help us, help us with that? We've had uh, another question. Pop okay. In. Yep. Um, have you experienced barriers pushed back from management on implementing a mental health first aid program? And how would you recommend overcoming this? Um, so, for me, per so for me personally, I've not had any barriers. So I'm probably the worst person in the world to answer that question. I don't know if anybody else has. Um, no, I, I, I've just done two jobs back to back that, that show two fundamentally different approaches from the producers. One of whom was very keen to integrate that into the. The resources, the time, the, the briefings and everything else, and one who is just not interested at all. Um, and it's then down to the individual employers to make sure it's in place for their uh, for their people, which is very difficult in the, sh in the shared workplace. So, um, so yes, there is absolutely pushback and it tends to be with the people that are fitting the maximum amount of time into the uh, ma maximum amount of work into the minimum amount of time and space, um, which by definition will then create more of those problems, I would imagine. Um, and there is there's a sub, there's a subsequent question in terms of the HSE um, raising doubt about the effectiveness. I'm not sure it's doubt. They've just got no evidence to show whether it works or not. That's my understanding of the HSE's position on the mental health, mental health first aiders. Um, so, 
but it's a stepping stone, isn't it? It's a first point of contact for somebody to broach a subject with someone that can then go elsewhere, wherever it needs to be focused. I think if we look at it at anything more than that, really, like what Adam was saying, um, that would be a mistake. You know, we're not professionals in, in that sense. To the mental health. And I, and There's got to be a route and we have to establish a route. That's yeah. to me what that function, uh, the function that provides. And, and I think it's, it, it's important that that shouldn't just be the only thing that organisations do. You know, it, it, it's it's the same as you know we've got our physical first aiders, but that doesn't mean that we can ignore doing the rest of health and safety. You know, because that would be wrong. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we've got management systems in place, we've got policies, we've got procedures, we've got reporting systems, and in addition to that, we've got mental health first aiders who can be there to support people. Um, it, it's quite interesting. There, there is lots of discussion, and there've been some private members' bills gone through the UK Parliament about making it a mandatory requirement. So you'll have your physical first aiders. And you'll have your mental first aiders, which will be in, in, enshrined in health and safety legislation. It hasn't been passed yet, but there's still a lot of chat that that could happen going forward. Mm. And I guess it's, it's the, the key thing there is the data as well, isn't it? Because as Greg was alluding to earlier on, that I don't think many, organ well, not every organisation is going to be collecting data on, on what their mental health first aiders are up to and that. So, you know, maybe there'll be a, a bit more of a shift, a shift there, which, which will help. I think when you have yeah, to sell it, Oh, go ahead, Bill. No, I was just going to say, there's another question, which I think Greg and Adam are, are very highly experienced in answering about green face paint. So I should, think we should let them answer that question. Oh, yes. Yeah. If an actor applies green paint to their face for every show, is the chemical used safe in the long term? Well, um, hopefully, yes. Uh, we, we, we have a show where we apply green paint. You can probably guess what that is. Um, of course, we review the product. We have the safety data sheets. Uh, that are reviewed. So we, we do ensure that, yes, that is uh, safe to use. Of course, every individual is different. They might have, you know, irritation from certain paints uh, or, or makeups that they use during the show. And, and we take that case by case as to, you know, what their particular needs are. And there's other things we can explore. Um, but um, I can't say definitely for you if, if the green paint you're using is safe, but I would recommend that you you know, follow your safety data sheet uh, and research that to make sure that yes, it is indeed safe. And and like you say, find out yeah who are you applying it on to? Whose face is it going on to as well? So that that's that big step too, isn't it? So identifying who might be harmed then, because yeah, one one actor may react in a very different way to that makeup than the next actor. Yeah. Very much. And personally, full disclosure, I I was uh, in a musical called Cats for two years. Many many. Jellicle moons ago and um uh you know we all reacted differently to putting on that type of makeup and there's certain like barriers you can put on and things like that so um i would recommend exploring that thank you uh, we, sorry i go, go on go greg i was just gonna say we've had two more questions pop into the q a halo but finish your thoughts yeah sorry. that's what i was gonna say we've got a question for tom specifically tom i don't know if you've read that question what's uh -huh. What are your top three hazards that often yes. need more control than they actually get? And is there a tendency for venues or productions to sometimes focus on the big when it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, very easy to identify the top three from my perspective, my experience. Um, work at height, um, vehicles and manual handling. Um, in terms of my recent experience, um, the work at height gets lots of attention, but the control is very often not effective. What's written in the risk assessment doesn't end up being what happens on site. And very often that's because what's written in the risk assessment has never been read by the people doing the work because it's not in the documents that they use to do to plan and carry out their work. Um, the, the vehicle issues um, can really be summarized as you know, a bunch of uh, local crew all standing around the back of the truck while it reverses up to the door. No, no proper management over the separation between the, the moving vehicles uh, and, and the crew that are there to unload them. Um, again, uh, there'll be a line in the risk assessment that says they should be managing that differently, but then it's the implementation on site. Uh, obviously, it's a bigger issue for touring than it might be necessarily for, for, um, for a venue. Um, with a, with a long run. Um, and the third one, manual handling, is, is an enduring disappointment for me, I have to say, in terms of an industry approach, because so much about 
um, moving the resources we need to put on a production can be dealt with on the drawing board. But there are still bits of equipment and scenery and, and other things that turn up on site that take six, eight, 12, 15 people to lift. Um, and it's not, it's not everybody, absolutely not. There's, but you know, there's a lot of good work going on. Um, there's a lot of challenges with our, some of our heritage buildings in terms of getting big, heavy stuff in and out, which is understood. But um, there is a whole piece of work that could be being done. And ultimately, this is just planning. So it shouldn't add massively in terms of the resources that are needed, um, because the design should be able to solve most of the manual handling problems if they're resolved on the drawing board at the time where the creative um, realisation is actually being thought through. Um, how many pieces is this going to come in? What's it going to be made of? Um, Obviously, there are time and motion considerations in terms of how long it then takes to put together and, and, and all those other things. But, but that's the time to be integrating all of those issues, all of those hazards into an effective management system to then reduce the amount of manual handling um, that, that's required. Um, and it's none of it. None of that to me is rocket science. And we could be doing more as an industry. Um, attention is sometimes spent on. Um, on getting the paperwork looking good rather than actually just sticking with the design drawing and putting the detail on that as to where the holes will be, where the brakes will be and all those other sorts of things. So, so yeah, that's, um, that's my answer to the top three. I don't know if anyone else has got any, uh, anything else that would come in. That's from a production point of view, obviously from a building management point of view, I imagine there's some differences. We're all nodding in agreement with you, Tom. <laughs> I was noticing um, uh, another question that we've got. Um, the, this person is interested to know what sort of measures the panel recommends for the control of COVID-19 within our buildings. Um, and then they've listed some controls that they're using, uh, daily lateral flow tests, wearing masks, uh, ventilation and so on. Um, and again, I think it's I think we can apply the 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 principle the hierarchy of control to COVID, can't we really? You know, so we're and we can see there in the list of controls that, that that person has suggested that, yeah, there's, um, you know, we're looking to reduce, um, you know, whether that's reducing the, the number of contacts that we have, the number of people that are in a space or, you know, reducing, um, using engineering controls then, so using our ventilation systems you know, to reduce the number of particles and, and that kind of thing. And then down into administrative controls like asking for, yeah, mandating testing and things like that. Um, and then PPE right down there at, at, the, at the bottom. Um, I don't think there's anything above and beyond that that that, that I would I would suggest that, that all feels. I don't have way. anything above and beyond that to suggest, mm. but I do want to point out that we've all collectively lived through 20 months of trauma, mm. and people's reactions to the different controls that are now in place at work for COVID-19 or otherwise can manifest them, manifest themselves. Apparently, another cup of coffee is needed in different ways. Um, so this is an area where we might see an uptick in some mental health psychological stress that's going on currently. Um, so just keep an eye on that. Yeah, and I'm noticing as well, there's, there's such a, a huge kind of array of emotions and responses and reactions to the, you know, the protocols or the procedures or things that, you know, we're putting in place, you know, each, each time I you know, review a policy or we, we implement something, there's every, every possible kind of reaction from you know from from members of staff and that and it's just really kind of yeah get kind of wrapping your head around that and and kind of working out yeah what what can I do in advance to plan for that and you know and help to ease people's minds and yeah yeah or and then on the other or the other scale other side of the spectrum is then how how am I continuing to motivate and encourage those that are absolutely sick to the back teeth of this now and just want to get back to normal how do I motivate them and encourage them to to carry on you know so yeah definitely it's um it's it's hard going this COVID isn't it and have we got sorry I'm just looking at the chat box um so we have um, another question of, about COVID how can we advise prevent and convince management about the effects of COVID-19 it seems more predominant during cold season and, and there's confusion with cold and flu and other diseases. Does anyone want to 
Well, I guess I guess for us, it, it, we're quite fortunate. We, it's a legal requirement for us to manage the COVID risk the same as any other health and safety hazard. So obviously, it's pretty clear in the guidance that we have got that we have to manage um, the risk the same as anything else. There has to be a risk assessment, and, and that driver, um, for the vast majority of my experience, seems to be enough for, for people to take it seriously. Obviously, there is people who are. COVID hesitant or, or, or COVID deniers, um, but in the winter, there's lots of illnesses that crop up anyway. So, you know, the good infection control management that an organization can put in place for COVID will also help with all the other things that we've got, like, you know, flu, cold, and the terrible thing, the norovirus, which is obviously vomiting and diarrhea illness. Anything that we do in, from an infection control perspective will also help prevent those things. So if people are hesitant towards COVID, then perhaps you could sneak some of those control measures in mm -hmm. to try to encourage your employees to prevent some of those other illnesses happening. Because if something like norovirus happens in your venue, you're going to lose lots of people to that because it, it, it is very, very kind of um, prevalent in the winter, unfortunately. Although I do want to say that um, alcohol hand sanitizer isn't isn't great for stomach bugs, so hand washing is the way forward. <laughs> hand washing is always best. I'm, I'm just but conscious of time. We've only got a couple of a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that it's a, um, that we should wrap up and say thank you very much to everyone for, for joining us and um, thank you to Phil, Adam, Tom and Greg um, and um, yeah and, and keep your eyes and ears um, peeled for our next webinar um, and then yeah and yeah thanks very much and, and, and take care. Thank you Haley. Thank you everybody. Thanks Anne. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you.